Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our alumni career panel. Uh, my name is Sean Kelly, and I'm the Assistant Director of Career Advising here at the School of Public Health at Brown. Um, today, we're fortunate to be joined by bachelor's and MPH alumni from Brown who work or have worked in the consulting industry in a variety of roles. Uh, so today, you'll learn about the job, the industry, the application process, and what you can do now to make yourself a competitive candidate uh, for consulting. So our goal is to be as interactive as possible. So thanks to those who submitted questions in advance, uh, you can also use the Q&A feature at the bottom of our screen to submit questions uh, that we'll pose to our panelists. And so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, and so it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce you to our panelists in alphabetical order, um, which happens to be the same in uh, first and last name, which I think is always interesting. So uh, we'll start with Caitlin Goodman, uh, MPH in the class of 18. Um, Caitlin's a 2018 grad of Brown School of Public Health and a current health policy consultant with Faulkner Consulting Group in Rhode Island. She supports state agencies, including Medicaid agencies and departments of health, as well as healthcare organizations by providing strategic, analytical, and operational insights to tackle complex healthcare challenges. Outside of work, Caitlin is the founder and director of Safe on the Road, a nonprofit agent advocacy organization that promotes safer streets for pedestrians and cyclists. So welcome, Caitlin. Thanks for joining. Next is Lorraine Limpahan. AB 14. Uh, Lorraine was a Brown University 2014 undergrad and concentrated in community health, which is now public health uh, with honors, as well as anthropology. During her academic career, she published her winning thesis poster while assisting researchers now on Brown SPH faculty, the Rhode Island based consulting firm Health Centric Advisors. Since then, her passions have been in digital health. She specializes in patient engagement tech, as well as healthcare price transparency tools, and has worked strategically across research customer success and account management, and more recently, product marketing functions. Welcome, Lorraine. Thanks for joining. Last but not least, Neil Odadara, AB of 09. Neil graduated from Brown in 2009, where he studied international relations. After graduation, Neil participated in the Clinton Fellowship for Service, through which he partnered with the Ashoka Foundation to support young social entrepreneurs in Mumbai. Following this, he has shaped a career as a consultant in the life sciences industry, supporting small to large biopharma companies with various aspects commercial strategy, including new opportunity assessments, portfolio investments, go-to market models, and launch preparation. In particular, he's worked with a number of companies who have developed innovative new therapies in the area of rare and orphan disease, neurology, oncology, and cardiometabolic disease. Thanks, Neil, for joining. Great. So let's just dive right in and start with a question for everyone, and then we'll move into our pre-submitted questions, uh, followed by our Q&A submissions. And here's Brooke. Let me introduce Brooke as well. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, so Brooke Adis uh, graduated in 2011 from Brown with a concentration in international relations. After working as a community organizer at the ACLU of Pennsylvania and as a paralegal at a plaintiff-only mass tort law firm in New York City, she learned that a career path in law was not for her. She pursued a master in public health with an interest in social determinants of health after working on dismantling the school-to-prison pipeline at the ACLU. She graduated from Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health in 2015. During her master's program, she worked for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in Correctional Health Care Administration on Rikers Island, overseeing a study on hep C and HIV testing and treatment in New York City jails. She currently works as a group leader of consulting services at Kaiser Permanente in San Francisco. Her team's portfolio includes quality performance improvement, lean transformation, end user training, and various strategic priorities. Thank you for joining, Brooke. We're very fortunate to have you here. So let's dive into that uh, question that we'll pose to everyone, and then we'll go into a Q and A. Um, so let's just start with a general question for everyone. What do you like most about your current job? And what would you say was your biggest learning experience since you graduated from Brown? And we can start alphabetically um, if you want to with Brooke. Hi everyone. Sorry, I was a few minutes late. I'm a I'm a new mother and was just putting my daughter down for a nap. <laughs> um, thanks for having me today on the panel. I think my favorite part of being a cons internal consultant at Kaiser Permanente is um, being sort of uh, there to witness uh, not just the strategic um, development of projects ideation phase, but also there for the implementation and the sustainability of our projects. And that's um, an advantage you have when you're an internal consultant with the organization that you are consulting with. Um, and I also really enjoy the variety in our portfolio. So I love 
that every few months my portfolio changes, my team's portfolio changes. You have the opportunity to um, really try to become a subject matter expert in various areas. Um, and I really enjoy that diversity. I'll, I'll echo Brooke's response and just say that the variety of projects that I've had the opportunity to work on um, as a consultant, I work um, externally with clients. And so our clients are, are varied, as, as Sean mentioned, state Medicaid agencies, departments of health, um, state health insurance exchanges. Um, so there's really um, a wide variety of projects that I've had the opportunity to work on. And um, if, if you are a learner, I feel like I just could, could, could be in school forever. Um, that, that's one of like my favorite parts of, of consulting is you are always learning. And, um, you know, sometimes it's a short engagement. It's, you know, a two month project. You do a deep dive and you have to learn a lot really quickly. Um, but it's, it's a great opportunity. I've had the chance to work on projects around behavioral health, um, maternal health, um, long-term services and supports and home and community-based services. Um, so there's just, you know, so many uh, projects that, that you get exposure to and um, there's something new every day. So that's my favorite part. I would say that for myself, my favorite part is really hearing feedback from healthcare organizations on the field, prospects or current customers that you have. There's so much noise in the healthcare industry and so many competing priorities and being able to solve for problems that you are knowing you're able to find the right person at the organization or the right team and being able to stay with that um, customer for a project or for long term, since I used to be in customer success, I would keep some of my customer relationships a little bit longer term in the past, being able to see that through and be able to see whether the solution you came up with and collaborated on together actually yield some of those metrics or results if you needed to tweak some of the, the results that you were calculating. It's just a very adaptable, fast uh, evolving field. And so it's lovely to really have those strong relationships with people in, in healthcare to be able to see the impact that you're truly having. Great. And thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, excited to be part of this panel and to uh, uh, have an opportunity to, to speak with all of you. I think that um, to echo, you know, similar point to, to Brooke and, and Caitlin, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that's uh, very excited, exciting about consulting that keeps me in it is the you know, the fact that the job is never the same every two to three months, every, 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 uh, every project is a new opportunity to dive into completely either, you know, completely esoteric uh, disease area or an esoteric part of a well-known disease, um, exploring the perspective across multiple stakeholders. Um, and I think that's, that's been a, a, a really um, uh, important aspect. And also I think one, uh, another thing that is, um, also been deeply rewarding is the mentorship um, element of consulting. So the opportunity to work closely with uh, your teams, being embedded with them, uh, getting to know uh, both people, you know, senior and junior to you and, and being able to establish those relationships has been hugely rewarding. Great, thanks everyone. So let's, let's get back to the basics in terms of what it takes to get a job in consulting, right? That's what everyone's really interested uh, who's on this uh, registrant list, but um, and the participants, the audience. Um, it's always interesting, you know, students always ask about, um, do I need soft skills? Do I need technical skills? Do I need, you know, X, Y, Z skills? Um, what kinds of skills are consulting firms looking for um, when they're looking for applicants? Um, and can you put that into perspective in terms of like what courses at Brown you took uh, that, that you really think helped you prepare for your current position? Um, one of those, if you knew no, now what you knew then or the other way around. Whoever wants to answer that. Um, I could start just because I don't know how long I have <laughs> until uh, the nap time is over. But um, so uh, definitely cross-functional communication and excellent communication skills is really important. So um, during the interview process, um, you may have to um, either do like a a written exercise, like a recommendation memo or a policy brief or um, a case study where you're presenting um, a deck of your recommendations and you're thinking through a scenario. And so um, communication skills, both written and uh, verbal are really important um, because you have various different stakeholders and clients and customers. Um, you wanna be able to speak to um, 
frontline workers as well as like executive leaders at the organization that you might be consulting with. Um, I took in undergrad, I took a health um, healthcare policy course. Uh, and when I was in undergrad, the Affordable Care Act was being passed. And so uh, each of us were asked to do a policy memo on a, a certain aspect of of the ACA and understand, you know, where there might have been um, compromises made or or um, where there were um, progress in certain areas. So uh, I think that course and that relationship I developed with that professor really has helped me in my career. I go back to her even now as a as a mentor um, and have used some of the skills that I developed in writing that healthcare po uh, that policy memo and that recommendation memo. Other courses that you thought were especially useful, um, anyone? Um, I would add that in my undergrad years, I initially fell in love with healthcare by taking a few medical anthropology courses and anthropology just you kind of ask yourself why with every scenario or situation you have right why is this a problem and you find it's not one root cause it's maybe 10 and they're overlapping different systems it's government it's economics and so i loved understanding why there were some structural issues in the healthcare system but anthropology wasn't really great about solving them so that's why i really loved healthcare because it's the practical applications of it but i would say that today healthcare overall whether it's the life sciences side or the provider delivery side is moving more towards consumerism and having the patient be the voice of the patient be really driving demand in an industry that's historically been very provider driven so i would say the anthropology is really great because you really try to understand ethnographies um, really try to understand the voice of the patient and their histories and that's something that I think is becoming a lot more valued for, for folks across the industry. I'll chime in and say um, in the MPH program, uh, I think it's changed since, since I went through the program, but um, I really wanted some more policy skills. Um, and, and I felt like the MPH program was, you know, very focused on, um, you know, if, if, potentially you're looking at a PhD and, and I knew that this was going to be my terminal degree. And so, you know, one of the, the beauties of going to Brown is you can kind of create your own curriculum. And, um, and I, I talked with, you know, our, our Dean and said, Hey, I really want to take this course that's in the MPP program, uh, the master's of public policy program. And, um, you know, here's why, and here's what skills I think I'm going to develop. And I think you can take that now as part of the MPH, but, um, that was a really valuable, um, class that I, I drew upon, um, or I continue to draw upon daily. Um, I also in the MPH program took Chris Kohler's uh, U S healthcare class. Um, and that's actually how I ended up in this job, Rhode Island being Rhode Island, um, and Chris Kohler being the former health insurance commissioner. Um, he introduced me to my boss that you should apply for this job. And um, so I would just say, cultivate those relationships, um, as Brooke was saying, with your professors. Um, they're so well connected. They are amazing mentors. Um, they want to guide you. They want to, you know, bring you into the field. Um, so I really credit, um, you know, that close relationship with Professor Kohler um, as helping me decide that this is what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, don't be afraid to look um, outside of the MPH curriculum or um, in the undergrad curriculum to take a class that, that sparks your interest. I think I would, I would, uh, I would echo the same. I mean, I think that uh, as I think about, you know, the relevant coursework that I had at Brown, what was most helpful to me was, you know, those courses which um, weren't necessarily focused on a particular subject matter, but the the skill building aspect. So participating in classes that either had small discussion groups or required group presentations, all of these things were actually quite helpful and. Um, in, in uh, you know, in, in uh, adapting to consulting early on. And I think to tie into uh, the earlier question that Sean had asked around, you know, what is also important to look for in, in interviews? I think that um, one thing I've certainly noticed in interviewing candidates is that you, there's an expectation of sort of a baseline. Everyone has a certain degree of kind of um, analytical rigor. You're, you know, you can do certain quality, you can do both um, quantitative and qualitative analysis, but a key differentiator is your ability to be resourceful and to be proactive. Um, certainly in the course of a day-to-day -day project, being, a, being, being able to demonstrate those qualities that show that 
Um, you are not someone, you're someone who can uh, appreciate uncertainty, respond to it and proactively seek, seek out, um, you know, a resolution to a problem that you're working on without necessarily having to wait for, you know, direct instruction. I think that that is uh, an essential skill set that um, those types of those types of classes certainly help to build. I might add one more thing just to build on what Neil was saying. I think sometimes it's hard to be able to demonstrate your ability to adapt and adjust and, you know, adapt to challenges on the fly. It's hard to demonstrate that through your coursework. And so I really would encourage folks to, to look at outside experience. Um, I think when we've interviewed candidates, it you know, if they're coming right out of a, a degree program, we, we look at their internship experience because it's hard to say, you know, oh, well, I had this test and then, you know, something came up like that challenge doesn't, you know, go as well uh, in an interview. But if you can speak to that in a real world working environment through an internship, um, I think that that is uh, much more impactful in the interview. So definitely, I know it's part of the MPH requirement, but um, yeah, look at uh, internship and uh, volunteer experiences that you can draw upon for, for those interview questions. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, let's get philosophical for a minute. Um, why consulting? What interested you in consulting? Um, why do you love doing it now or as part of your career path? Um, I'm, yeah, I think I'm, I'm happy to, to take this one first. So, uh, I mean, for me personally, I, you know, the reason I found, um, I, or I continue to find consulting really valuable is it's just, uh, I think that, that, uh, the, uh, sort of the, the diversity of things that you get to work on, um, I find it intensely rewarding. It's something that keeps me engaged. It keeps me interested. Um, I also think that it's a nice, uh, you know, when you're working on, um, certain projects you are brought in is someone who's, uh, whose, whose perspective is that you're kind of an independent uh, advisor. You're not necessarily married to whatever the internal politics are within an organization. And that way, it offers a lot of latitude in, in the way that you're able to think about a problem and anticipate and, and provide recommendations. And I think that that, uh, that just is, is something that adds to the, the kind of excitement with each project. I think one of the things I really enjoy is being able to um, have an impact on a, a lot of lives. You know, the work that we do um, for a state Medicaid agency, it, it might be a small project, you know, it, it's, it's very specific within the Medicaid agency, but it's going to have an impact on, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives. And that is what gets me excited about the work. Um, we, we don't often get to hear, you know, personal stories about lives that you've touched, but you, you do get to see the impact, um, you know, on a, on a population health scale. And that is, is really rewarding to me, um, being able to see a policy pushed through or, um, you know, a new program implemented that's going to have, um, you know, change for, for years to come. So that, that gets me to work every day. Um, I really uh, enjoy the problem solving aspect of it. And I think that was what uh, drew me both um, getting an opportunity to work um, collaboratively with, with a team, whether it's the stakeholders or junior consultants or other members of your own team, um, or working independently um, on working on different challenges. Um, so um, as Neil mentioned, there it might be an ambiguous ask, like we wanna understand why there's, um, why there's an increase of falls in the hospital or something. Um, or um, whether it's a very clear directive, like for us as internal consultants, it's like we need to stand up a drive-through COVID testing tent in 48 hours. Um, it's, it's, I love the problem solving on both ends of those things, whether you have an ambiguous um, problem you're trying to uh, understand where you have to sort of dig and try to find out what the root cause is, or whether it's like a, straight implementation, which we do as, as internal consultants. So um, yeah, both, both things like working independently, working collaboratively, and then getting to solve problems. 
Yeah, um, I echo what everyone mentioned about problem solving and impact. I think what's really exciting about consulting and the variety of problems that come before you is that you get to be a lot more well-rounded. You get to have a lot more freedom around what you want to become a subject matter expert in. I think it's a, you know, especially the field that we're in, it's growing, it's adapting every day. So I think it's taken a few years of doing different projects and working with different customers to really figure out what it is in healthcare that, that, that I'm really passionate about. Great, really interesting perspectives. Thank you all. Um, let's move into the interview process because I know that's, I think, what's very daunting for a lot of people right now in their current positions. Um, who in the, the panelist group had to do case interviews as part of the application process? And if you did, can you enlighten us on the process, please? What did you do to prepare for them? What did you feel most confident about? What do you feel like you could have done better in terms of preparing for them? Um, I would say that uh, I, the the thing that I wish I could have done better is that uh, in my early consulting interviews, I wish I had done more case prep. I think that uh, the thing that I always um, try to relay to potential consulting candidates is that the, um, I mean, the case is the easiest thing that you can sort of get wrong, meaning that the minimum expectation, certainly, I think, you know, in a lot of cases is that you will be able to make your way through the case. You may not arrive at the right answer, but it, it, really what you're being tested for in the course of it is, are you someone who can, um, you know, think and communicate in a logical and structured manner? Are you someone who can kind of handle pressure and uncertainty? And then if you kind of, if you take those two things aside, the rest of it's just kind of basic math, which you can, uh, basic math and in some subject matter knowledge that you can get through just doing a couple of a couple of case prep interviews. So um, a case in point is really, um, was a really uh, powerful resource and there are even more resources now. So I think practicing the cases is is important, getting getting a degree of comfort down. And then, um, you know, once you, I think once you have that, everything else is, that's the, that's really the, the focus of the interview um, from your uh, interviewer's perspective. You know, it's the, it's evaluating the fit after that. I would say that for me, ironically, I didn't have to do a case interview until my current role in product marketing. I think consulting like roles really vary in the tech industry, depending on the size of the company. Um, sometimes it's more of a presentation type case study example. Uh, one thing that I would have done better that, since it was my first official one was really, I think, tried to practice a lot more and look at YouTube videos and examples. But one thing that I think really stood out is even though I didn't arrive at the right answer, I thought really hard about the practical applications, the problem I was trying to solve. It wasn't actually about the right answer. So I thought about it after my interview. I created a one pager that highlighted everything that we talked about and made it look like a very client friendly deliverable and I included different personas of people um, who what their takeaway from that meeting would be and what type of how the solutions would help um, drive business impact. And so I put a lot of thought into, OK, now here's the problem. How do we actually go about fix this? And I delivered I sent this over and just I wouldn't you know, I'd always be open to thinking about the problems after you leave that interview and thinking of new ideas or, hey, I thought of a different approach or I would actually I thought about it, I'd approach a little differently. Here's some bullet points. I'd love to maybe follow up if you know you have time to discuss it. And I think that's something that really wowed the people that I was um, I was interviewing with, but it really came out of frustration because I, I left that interview thinking, wow, I really did not practice enough for that. Um, and I really, really wanted to figure out what the problem was. And this was trying to figure out how much to price a solution to sell to a hospital health system. Um, another thing that I would add is to uh, not actually, aside from the quantitative or the case study interview portion, is to not um, undermine the personal connection that you make with your interviewer. Um, I could say that one interview I had that always sticks with me today is um, I interviewed with the founder of a tech startup I used to work for, and we actually had more of a real conversation. Um, he asked me if you know, there's a lot of challenges working for a startup that's trying to scale. Do you tend to see life as more of lemons or lemonade? And I thought this is a really weird question to ask someone during an interview, but uh, we ended up having a really great conversation about it. And again, leaving that room, 
I still thought about our conversation. I, uh, I thought about ways I could follow up and reach out to this person, person or, or uh, how to integrate that into my life. So I remember in my thank you note, I sent a packet of crystal light lemonade. Um, and then I guess the rest is history. But I think, yeah, so just don't, you know, the, the interview doesn't actually end at the end of the interview is the interview I would give is the uh, advice I would give to folks. I can share a little bit about my interview process. Um, I typically have worked for smaller firms throughout my career. Um, you know, not a, not a big consulting firm, but rather small boutique. Um, and so I would echo what Lorraine was saying in terms of, you know, having that personal connection is, is really, a, a, you know, especially at a small firm, um, you need to have that interpersonal connection with the, the folks you're gonna be working close to with. Um, in the interviews that I've done, um, I've had two timed assessments. And so, um, I think what, what they're really trying to assess with a timed assessment is your ability to distill a lot of complex information very quickly. And, and like others are saying, it doesn't necessarily matter if you get the answer right. It's, it's more about your approach. Um, and one thing I found challenging in the transition from the academic world to consulting is in the academic world, you know, you, you sometimes have unlimited time, right? And you're gonna work and work and work until you get to the answer and you wanna go really deep. If you're a learner, you're gonna read everything and go down rabbit holes and that doesn't work in consulting. Um, if you go down a rabbit hole, you're gonna be <laughs> out of luck on the, the you know, timed assessment. And so it's really about your ability to pull up quickly um, and, and sooner than maybe you feel comfortable with. Um, you may not know the right answer, but um, can you get to some strategic recommendations? And it's okay if the answer is, you know, I want to revisit this, or as Lorraine was saying, you know, ask questions subsequently. But I think what they're really looking for is your ability to um, get to uh, an, an answer in a timely fashion, because your clients are always going to. Um, there's there's never enough time. You just you, you run out of time, and so that's that's I think the the mantra in consulting. So you have to get comfortable with good enough. Um, and I would say in those um, timed assessments, you know, making sure that stuff is is ready for, for client facing, um, you know, practice those PowerPoint skills, um, you know, that, that what you learn, um, you know, the PowerPoints that you want in, in school may be very different than the approach of client materials um, for the, the firm that you're interviewing for. So see if you can find any of those materials online. I remember in one grad school class, we were not allowed to have any words on our PowerPoint slide in one class that was just you know the, the professor's preference um and now if you look at my slides there are so many words <laughs> so you know it's, it's very different um so i would just say try to you know take a step back from the you know very academic approach and, and remember that you are interviewing um for a consulting role so that would be my suggestion um the other piece of advice i would give so i've experienced two types of interviews either the proctored one where you are doing the case study live with a person walking you through the scenario and asking you questions along the way and and um, taking you through or as um, caitlin mentioned like a timed one where they might send you a one pager scenario or a data set in, in it in an excel and then you have say two hours to go through that material and send them back a, a, a presentation or a recommendation. And then, you know, at a later time, you'll walk through them. Um, my recommendation during a proctored one, because you have that, that live person who's walking you through the case, don't be afraid of asking questions. Um, and I think uh, that's very important, actually. That's an important skill that they're looking for to see. Um, see your thinking process and um, see uh, that you are able to, to distill, um, you know, the important points to be able to get to uh, a, a resolution. So um, that's something I was always afraid to ask um, questions. And uh, that, that's something I see people who are really successful in this proctored interviews are really um, thoughtful and um, clear. But I think everything that the others have have stated, you know, practicing case studies is really important and practicing your um, PowerPoint presentation skills. Um, I see in the Q&A, someone asked if it's like different healthcare um, consulting interviews versus um, other uh, like, I don't know, big four consulting. 
um, I wouldn't say that different, but having some knowledge base of, you know, the healthcare industry, understanding um, those types of clients that that healthcare consulting um, organization might work with. So uh, knowing, you know, the difference between an HMO and a PPO or knowing more about Medicare, Medicaid, um, depending on who the clients of that uh, consulting firm are, I think um, are important. Great, really insightful, everyone. A quick follow-up question. Do any of your firms use um, online interview tools these days? You may not have used them when you were applying, but do you implement them in like a first round interview process, like a pre-recorded, they get asked a question, they have a, an amount of time to answer it. Do any of your firms use that now as an initial interview tool? No, okay. Um, and so it definitely seems like soft skills are a big highlight um, to Neil's point, kind of building upon the foundation that you already have from, from an education at Brown. I'm really developing those soft skills and making sure that you're um, really relying on them throughout the interview process is really interesting. So, so let's move into what makes you a more competitive applicant now. Like what can you do now? You might be starting um, the application process. You might be ending your undergraduate career or you're maybe a first year student in an MPH or a PhD program. You're interested in looking forward. Um, what can you do now to make yourself a more competitive candidate? It's, it's definitely an open-ended question, um, but we'd love to hear your different perspectives on that question. I, I would say, um, I mean, I think a couple of things that are um, that are certainly very helpful is uh, effectively looking for ways that you can differentiate as a candidate. So, you know, with the case study, the the um, in, in my experience, the, the idea is that you expect that everyone sort of has a baseline, right, level of rigor. There are only so many ways that you can answer a market sizing question. And then, you know, you'll get some help from the um, from the proctor of the, the case study. But having a degree of healthcare um, knowledge, I think, like being able to drop in certain terms shows that uh, you are actually excited, engaged around the space. But so, similar to what Brooke was mentioning, I think that's a that's a good way to differentiate. I think a, a thing that's often underappreciated is being very deliberate and being research and, and, and having research. Mm -hmm you know, why you're applying to a particular firm, particularly in the healthcare consulting space. A question that you may, uh, that we usually um, ask is, you know, why healthcare consulting? And then if you can also show, demonstrate some level of knowledge around why a particular particular firm, I think that's, that's really helpful. And that's where some of the early legwork around just talking to people who work there can be really can be a very powerful differentiator. And if you've even, sp if you've spoken to someone who's worked there, that will get through at some point to the interviewer. It shows that you're you're really engaged and that will help differentiate you from someone else who also similarly, you know, got to the right answer on the case. It's not just the case is the, the minimum expectation. I, I mentioned this earlier, just in terms of the, the internship or, you know, outside experience. Um, but I think in, in any interview I've ever done, um, I, I very much draw upon those those internship or or past job experience. Rarely am I talking that much about the coursework, and so I would really encourage you to get off campus, explore, um, and 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 do do some other internships or um, you know locally. There's there's so many great opportunities. Um, the Department of Health in in Rhode Island has some great internship programs that actually pay, which is great. Um, and, you know, volunteer opportunities, you, you can speak to those as well. Um, the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to share about other parts of yourself in the interview process. Um, I think I always wanted to you know, share about my myself as a candidate and, you know, your academic experience and your credentials and your past work experience. Um, but, you know, aside from who I am as a healthcare consultant, um, I was also a collegiate athlete. Um, I continue to run competitively. And in early interviews, early in my career, I didn't really bring that up. Um, and in the past two jobs that I've gotten, I've shared about my athletic experience and what that brings, um, you know, what what that has, has done for me as a as a person and, and how that can benefit the, the company. And, um, you know, to Neil's point, kind of differentiate yourself um, or, or talk about a challenge that you've encountered, you know, on the track or in the pool or um, what, whatever other outside extracurriculars you participate in. So don't be afraid to um, share a little bit more about yourself, at least in these 
small boutique firms that I tend to work at, um, you know, that that shows that you have interests and you're a well-rounded person and um, you don't live at the library, right? And, and you know, people want to work with people um, who they're going to have a, a strong relationship with and consulting, you know, there's long hours, there's late nights. Um, I'm with my team a lot virtually these days, but um, you know, you, you want to be a, a person that others enjoy spending time with. So don't be afraid to share a little bit more about yourself. One thing that I would add, um, and this may not apply to everybody, but as far as um, working on communication skills and deliverables. One thing that I wish I had done more of in my early years, and this is before LinkedIn <laughs> really became a big tool to be able to share ideas, but having some credible work in blogging or talking about different issues in industry, if it is something that you're passionate about or you like to write, I definitely encourage it. It's something that I had done in prior roles that ended up being very valued, it, val valuable for later roles that I uh, interviewed for. Um, and in the past, I had done a lot of research through school, kind of um, like Caitlin was mentioning earlier, you get so sucked into the academic way of writing. So later in my career, when I tried to write thought pieces, it was very, very challenging for me to make it sound not like a full on, you know, 12 page research paper. So that's something I wish I had done a lot more of back then. There's lots of forums, I think, nowadays to share ideas that are a lot more popular, like media or even just sharing blog posts on LinkedIn. So something that if you're interested in writing, if you want to be able to show some other you know, work and communication skills and ideas you have on, on different ongoings in, in the industry, it's something I, I definitely highly encourage. Awesome. Oh, go ahead, Brooke, please. No, I just was going to echo the... Um, many things that everyone else said, but uh, the internship experience, um, I think is really important, especially if you are, you know, an, an undergrad or, um, um, or have gone right to your MPH from undergrad and don't have um, a lot of uh, long term professional experience, um, internships are really important. And I encourage you to do internships even during the semesters, if you can, or find those volunteer experiences, because I think, um, those real world experiences translate really well in an interview more than um, coursework examples. And I think that's been said, but just echoing. Great, thanks everyone. So we have about five minutes left. If anyone wants to ask any questions through the Q&A feature, um, I have not heard anyone talk about their resume. It's kind of a joke, but um, <laughs> everybody's worried about their resume, their materials, things like that. Um, what resources are most important to focus on now? Um, and what resources do you think um, benefit you in the long term? LinkedIn, for example, I know is really popular these days, but that's just one example. What, what are your answers? I would, I would build off what Lorraine said um, in terms of sharing, you know, uh, about yourself um, on, on social media that can help you or hurt you. Um, and so be really cognizant. Um, we check, you know, we Google everybody, we check. Um, and, you know, I, um, I, I recently went through an interview process and, you know, was, was pretty engaged in conversations on Twitter and social media about vaccination and mask wearing um, and in healthcare that's an important thing to be talking about. And um, so, you know, make sure that you're having professional conversations in those spaces. But um, I think that to Lorraine's earlier point, that can help you, um, it, you know, if you have a strong presence and, and you are eloquent in, in your writing um, and, and eloquent in your conversations with folks. So, um, you know, I certainly have a LinkedIn presence, but, but also maintain a, a social media presence. And I've seen some folks um, kind of like the med Twitter um, hashtag, you know, folks have really been able to elevate their profiles um, and, you know, promote their own research and, and show that they, they can have thoughtful conversations around difficult subjects and um, have seen folks do, do really well with that. And I can dive in and say that I found all of you on LinkedIn. So that's the tool that I use the most, um, but I, I will be happy to share um, with anyone who reaches out to the career office, um, how you can easily find 
um, amazing Brown alumni who work in awesome industries um, and can connect you with them. But um, yeah, we don't have any other submitted questions. Let's see, it looks like you might have one. So here's one. Are there any tips you have for international students? Um, it's very hard to get past the resume review stage. And so um, we're wondering if there are any tips on getting noticed, um, anyone who, who might be in the process of hiring international students at their firms. And if you don't, we can certainly connect offline. Uh, I'm happy to connect with that student offline. Okay, so looks like we don't have any questions. And so um, I would really like to thank you all, Brooke, Caitlin, Lorraine, and Neil. Um, can't thank you enough for sharing your perspectives today. Um, again, it's, it's an industry and a sector that um, students are very interested in. And so hearing your insights today has been extremely helpful. Um, and so this webinar recording will be shared um, at our career website, brown.edu slash go slash careers. We'll be able to find it posted in the next few days. Um, and again, thank you all for joining and thank you to our panelists again for your time and uh, insights. Thanks so much.